If you can settle down, please, so we can start our next session. Can I have your attention, please? I'd like to welcome you all to the next session. If you'd like to settle down and take your places, please. Thank you. The Lahore Literary Festival is very proud to welcome to the stage a person who is known as the greatest historian Pakistan has produced. Aisha Jalal is the Mary Richardson Professor of History at Tufts University. She is a recipient of Sitara Imtiaz amongst many other accolades. She writes on the history of South Asia and we are so proud to welcome her today. She has been with the LLF since the very start and it's a great honor to have her here for the 10th edition of the Lahore Literary Festival. So please give her a big round of applause. And with that, I'll hand over to our moderator for today to start the session. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for attending this session. Um, Phantom of History, 75 years of Pakistan. It was about freedom, azadi from Hindu majoritarianism in 1947, freedom from the British overlords in 1947. What happened afterwards? What does Azadi in Pakistan, Pakistan now mean? If you look especially at the history of Pakistan after 1971 when East Pakistan broke away, Lakta aise hai ke abhi hume azadi se azadi chahiye. We want to be free from freedom. Agar hamari legislation aap dekh lehen, 73 ke baad onwards, we are always trying to curb freedoms. To azadi ka nature kya hai, azadi ka character kya rahe gya hai Pakistan mein, hum sab azadi ki baat karte hain. Aur mera first question Aisha se yehi hoga. Aisha, what does you being a historian and uh, one of the most influential historians in the region who's, who's documented and who's explored so many dimensions of uh, uh, the history of South Asia, Pakistan especially, what does, when we talk about freedom, we listen to the name of freedom. On Independence Day, we got freedom, 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 freedom. What does, just a minute, I think we have to be scared of freedom. Yes? Uh, well, I mean, I, I suppose this is in English or in Urdu? Or well, <laughs> uh, well, uh, azadi, I mean, or freedom, it's a, it's a discursive category, as well, by which I mean an abstract category as well as an existential reality. And uh, freedom in Pakistan is one issue, but I think the world over, uh, there is uh, one of the dominant discourses at the moment is the persistence of unfreedom in freedom. Uh, I mean, you've all heard of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, that's exactly what it's being talked about. So freedom is something that you are constantly aspiring for. Uh, so it is a bit of a phantom uh, uh, that you're constantly chasing. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, you, know, you can actually quantify freedom. It's a state of mind at one level. Uh, and it's also a discursive category at another. Uh, Pakistan has had 75 years, and I would like to sort of congratulate Pakistan on its 75th um, uh, anniversary of independence. Uh, let's just say, start on a positive note, and I hope we can end on one, but certainly on a positive note is that this country was not meant to survive for more than six months. Uh, and so 75 years is definitely um, uh, a long time uh, and something to relish, but uh, there's been a price that's been paid for this freedom. Uh, and I think that's where the history is. The history is not about whether Pakistan will survive, because people have written books on this, uh, but uh, the, the fact is that it has survived. And how has it survived? And under what circumstances? 
uh, that is the stuff of history. Uh, Aisha, you said that this country wasn't supposed to or expected to survive more than six months. Uh, in your book, and which is one of, still one of the most influential books written on the history of this region, the sole spokesman on Mr. Jinnah, you said the thing which sticks out in that book and did become sort of controversial because that book was first written in 1985 and it was uh, during a very harsh military dictatorship that it came out. The thing which sticks out in that book was, and people started to talk about it a lot, was that you mentioned that Mr. Jinnah initially and originally did not want to partition India. He didn't want to create a new country. There were circum certain circumstances which forced him to do that. Well, yes. Uh, I think one of the main points I make in, the so uh, in, the, in Self and Sovereignty is that we make the, the mistake of assuming that the end result of the Pakistan movement, uh, which is Pakistan as, you, as, you, as it emerged in 1947, was the exact Pakistan that Jinnah wanted. Uh, I show very carefully in my book um, that uh, he wanted a lot more. Uh, and so it's a great mistake to confuse partition with Pakistan. He wanted a Pakistan, uh, but he wanted a Pakistan based on uh, the Muslim majority provinces uh, that could either um, forge uh, a, a sort of a confederal arrangement with uh, what he called Hindustan, Hindi, Hindu majority provinces, and note that he always spoke of Pakistan and Hindustan, not, not Pakistan and India. Um, uh, and so I think that's really important. Uh, alternatively, he said that uh, if, if not a confederal arrangement, then treaty arrangements on matters of common concern. In either case, there had to be mutual adjustments. Uh, so I think the, the whole confusion stems from the fact that we assume that Pakistan meant partition. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you even read Ambedkar's uh, Pakistan or Partition, uh, which uh, frankly was a book that I read when I was an undergraduate and was struck by that distinction. Um, he makes a distinction. So I think that the whole confusion in the mind is that Pakistan and partition are equated. Uh, but the partition of India was the partition of Punjab and Bengal. That is what really the issue was. The other major problem with the confusion of partition and, and Pakistan is the presumption that Pakistan was predominantly created because of religious reasons. Um, well, I mean, uh, you know, religious reasons for me mean uh, matters to do with the, the scriptures uh, and not with politics. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I would like to say that Pakistan is a product of India's federal problem. And the insistence on seeing this as a religious one in bo on both sides of the border is the nub of the problem of India and Pakistan. India today faces a federal problem, uh, not a Muslim problem, but it's creating one. Pakistan also has a federal problem, uh, but we keep talking about the lack of Islamicness in this country. So I do think that there is a confusion of categories uh, when we talk about these uh, matters. Thank you, Aisha. It's very interesting that you said that religion wasn't really the central theme. Well, I mean, religion was a the central theme insofar as the British had created a political category, a separate political category for Muslims which yeah. had to be represented. And Mr. Jinnah and the Muslim League came forward to represent that category. Right. That was already within the structural uh, 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 buildup of the, of the British representative system. The so that religion was there in that sense. And in my book, Self and Sovereignty, I made the distinction between religion as identity yeah. and religion as faith. So yes, religion as identity played a role, but it had nothing whatsoever to do with religion as faith. Agreed, agreed. Well put. Uh, in 2015 or 2016, I'm not sure, <clears throat> uh, a member of uh, Jamiyat Ulama Islam, uh, who had been trolling me on Twitter for quite a while, he threw a book at me, figuratively speaking, uh, saying, listen, you liberal fascist, read this book written by this Indian academic. And the book was called uh, Creating a New Medina. And when I read the book, it was obsessed with Aisha's the thesis she was developing ever since uh, the sole spoke, uh, spokesman. And uh, he insisted that Pakistan as a project was a well-constructed thought which was definitely looking to create an Islamic Republic and maybe 
evolve into a Sharia Republic or Sharia state. And uh, it was interesting that that book was, I think, published by Cambridge, I think. And uh, that book got a lot of traction among forces in this country who insist or who present Mr. Jinnah as some sort of an Islamic ideologue. Did you read that book? Because it was all about you. It was trying to just debunk what you've been saying. Well, I mean, uh, the Nupalia's book is um, uh, really looking, I mean, uh, in the sole spokesman, I had said that Mr. Jinnah left the Pakistan demand vague um, uh, and allowed the Muslim Muslims to make of it what they wished. So Mr. Dalupalia went and discovered uh, what the Muslims had made of it uh, and concluded that it was definitely meant to be an Islamic Republic. But I think it's important to realize when he wrote the book, uh, it was written in a context of increasing interest in religion in India itself. In the United States, the cultural uh, turn has occurred many years ago, but there's more interest in religion there too. Uh, so I think he was really sort of trying to fit into that moment in history. And, you know, Cambridge University Press uh, publishes all manner of books, good and bad. Uh, so, and, and uh, you know, the real measure of a book is not what it, uh, how people respond to it when it first comes out, uh, but how long it lasts in terms of its influence on the field. Uh, and I don't think the Lopalia's book, uh, I think it's already been dropped uh, from syllabi uh, when it first came up, uh, it was. Uh, but I do think that the mistake he makes is to presume that just because there were elements in the UP talking about the creation of a religious state, um, that you know, he had to make the link then to uh, the post-independence scenario. Uh, you know, we know from Mr. Jinnah's own experience uh, uh, with Raja of Mahmudabad, uh, who was his very close friend, uh, and of course he was a financial patron of the Muslim League. Uh, and Raja Mahmudabad wanted him to uh, say that Pakistan will be an Islamic state, and he, he, he rejected that. He rejected it publicly again in 1943 with Nawab Bahadur uh, Jang, uh, who also wanted him to commit. So I do think that you, know, you can say that there were elements who dreamt of creating an Islamic state, but to say that Mr. Jinnah and the Muslim League leadership were committed to that, and it was a done deal, I think is just false history. Sociologists and anthropologists have written about this resurgence of uh, interest in religion all over the world, in the West as well, and now we're seeing in India. Hamarianto, like it's always been here, especially, like I said, after 1971. But as a historian, how do you see it? Why is it happening? I think that uh, this question of religion is a very problematic one, and in fact, my next book uh, actually uh, deals with it at great length to really, you know, we talk about capital R religion, uh, but as I just pointed out, uh, the religion that, uh, uh, that, that was consequential in the creation of Pakistan was religion as identity. Uh, and yes, religion is a mobilizational, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's a way to mobilize uh, people, uh, uh, but, you know, that's a political mobilization. I mean, I can, I, to give you an example, I mean, the, the, the main difference between the Congress and the Muslim League was not on uh, the scriptures, not on ideas of God, or even on prayer. They were about politics. They were about power. They were about political representation. Why are we so reluctant to call a spade a spade? Why this insistence uh, to call it religious well, I think it's because it gives legitimacy to the call. Uh, and, that's what, and, and so when you say there's, a, there's an upsurge in religion, uh, I would hate to, to, to call this religion in India where women uh, who out of their own volition choose to wear the hijab are suddenly being told that they cannot wear it uh, because religious uh, symbols are not allowed. So I do think that there is a confusion of categories. And you can argue, well, this is what religion has become. Then I would say that then this religion is welcome to you. It's not to me. So basically, it's, 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 it's all about political mobilization. It's all politics, yes. either here in, in Pakistan Absolutely. or India. Uh, in your book, Self and Sovereignty, you write that what Hindu means in, in, uh, in, in this region, what Muslims mean in this region, actually was formed in that century, later after the, uh, uh, the, the uh, soldiers uprising in 1857. And you say, when the British introduced the idea or the concept of uh, census, that is when people became 
or were forced to define themselves as who they are, what their religion is. And that gave birth to, to what eventually evolved and led to the Hindu, uh, the supposedly Hindu-Muslim divide. Even though we've seen, and if you go, go through the uh, census, there was all kinds of Hindus, all kinds of Muslims. And they were actually also not agreeing with each other. But what is it that eventually, fine, we know. First, first let's talk about the uh, census thing. What if, what hypothetically if, uh, speaking. I think you need to move back before the census to realize that there was a Indo-Persian world in which religion was not the main factor hmm. uh, of your placement within the, uh, the, the, the political system. It was your merit. It was based on merit and obviously your allegiance to the most important element, which was the ruler, the sovereign. Uh, the, the sovereign was the embodiment of sovereignty. Uh, so I think that uh, religion was not uh, uh, an issue. Uh, Hindus, Muslims uh, were uh, in high positions uh, uh, in the Mughal uh, uh, Empire. We know that. Uh, and so India, diversity of religion was a given. Uh, the British, on the other hand, being culturally alien, were acutely aware of the religious diversity of India and opted uh, to make uh, uh, and take advantage of that and, 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 and pit the two. And this is not a standard argument of divide and rule, but it's also British perception. They actually thought uh, uh, from their own experiences with the Muslim world in West Asia uh, that Islam was separate. So when they put the, uh, the census together in the mid 19th century, what they did was to say that anybody who was not a Muslim uh, was a Hindu. And then 10, uh, 20 years later, they felt that Hindu was too broad a category. So then they came up with caste in, in, in Hindu. So, so the point is that, that, that this, the British in their own context, where as many of you will know, uh, have had um, uh, differences between Protestants and Catholics, they did not choose to enumerate, did not choose to do the census enumeration uh, by privileging the religious category, but they did so in India. Uh, so I think that has played a very crucial role in the transformation of the idea of religion from something that has to do with your personal faith, something that has to do with your daily, everyday practice, to a category. So I think it's religion, capital R, as the category that has been the fundamental problem and continues to be. And it has to do with censuses and it has to do with the way in which the public discourse got configured. Because the British argued that religion was a private matter. It's something you did at home. But the moment you went into the quote-unquote public sphere, you hung religion on the door, and you arrived, and you were non-religious in a public material sphere. Mm -hmm. Now, these are just, these are just con constructions. These are not real things. Uh, so I think this is the, the, the actual problem with our confusion about religion. So I do think that we should realize that religion is a personal matter. Uh, but the way religion has emerged in the public sphere uh, has been informed by colonial categories and the conveniences of those categories for the post-colonial state and its elite. Where does jihad fit in? Because you've written a whole book called Jihad in South Asia and how it evolved, basically largely emerging in the early 19th century. Then you heard Muslims or certain segments of the Muslims uh, use the word jihad or the concept during the 1850s, uh, 1857 uprising and then again during the Khilafat movement and the, you go then in your book go all the way till today where of course we see uh, forces like the Taliban and uh, etc still use it so where where does jihad sit and was that how did how did it evolve how is it different than what jihad meant maybe in the 19th century or is it the same thing? Or what, was it also some sort of a construct within the Muslim uh, community? I mean, jihad is a, certainly a concept in uh, Islam. And, but as I, I think everybody knows that there are uh, different meanings to uh, jihad. There's the inner jihad, which is the greater jihad. And there's the, is the, there's the physical jihad, the military jihad, which is the lesser jihad. So I mean, jihad has had many, many different interpretations. There's no, not one. One of my main points in Partisans of Allah, which I wrote on jihad, was that Muslims have never agreed on what constitutes a jihad. Um, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the long durée of Muslim history, you will see that jihad was used even 
against uh, rulers who happen to be Muslim. So if a Muslim chronicler was writing uh, about a war, he would, he, would, he would identify the enemy as kafir, against whom the Muslim ruler was waging jihad. So waging jihad against a fellow Muslim is not typically Islamic. Uh, so I think that Muslims, you know, we, we typically assume that jihad is something uh, that's there in the law, it's there eternal for all times to come, and that people utilize. But what I show uh, is that this idea of jihad has itself been historically formulated and means different things in different periods. So again, like a mobilizational technique, like religion, jihad also has had its salience and will likely continue to have. Uh, in self and sovereignty, when you're discussing and exploring the whole landscape of the Muslim community and the Hindi community in the 19th century, how identities were being formed by both the communities, and there were vast differences between one form of Muslimness and the other. Uh, even till, I would say, in the 1946 elections, if one studies, I came through, uh, I came across a, a, a quote from a Bengali politician who had uh, contested the election, the 1937 election from Bengal, had lost, and he said that Bengali's idea of Muslim or Islam is definitely different than what it is in Punjab or what it is in Sindh. Do you think, and this, is, this fascinates me, that the Sindhis and the Punjabis and the Bengalis, Muslim, re, Muslim majority regions in India, how, if, if was there a clear difference at how each one of these communities uh, practiced Islam? Well, I, I, I think that the Bengali politician who remains unnamed uh, <laughs> uh, is, is attributing too much coherence to uh, understandings of Islam uh, in both Sindh and Punjab, I think there are many divisions. I think that, you know, if you are looking at religion's public face, um, then the mobilizational methods utilized do try to present a unifying image. But in fact, religion as personal faith is very varied. And it would be quite erroneous to try and assume that somebody's personal faith is exactly the same as what is presented at a as a collective level. Uh, so I do think we need to distinguish between Islam in the public sphere and yeah. what it has become and what religion means to, to, to you personally. So if he's saying that religion practiced in Punjab is very different from Bengal, he's not entirely wrong uh, because you know, th there were different manifestations here than there were, I mean, there was, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, the, the, the Sufi aspect is much stronger, uh, the Bengal uh, is Islamic, um, uh, practice is more uh, uh, sort of informed by what people call, you know, Indic Im images. Uh, but I think even in Islam, I mean, this, uh, the, uh, um, even in sort of Punjab, there is a great deal of variety between Sufi Islam and the more orthodox uh, Islam. I'm glad you say that because recently when we saw the rise of a political force called the TLP, which is Brailvi uh, Islam, it is interesting if you note uh, the election results, let's say about the 2018 election results. It, has, it did very well in certain areas of Punjab, central Punjab especially, but it was nowhere in interior of Sindh, outside Karachi. Now both Sindhis, in, are, a majority of Sindhis are also Barelvis, and of course, the Punjabi voters of TLP were also Barelvis. So maybe I agree with you that on an individual level, definitely they differ, but do you think it's more of a political thing? Like Absolutely. I mean, the point is that uh, the, the, the TLP um, uh, is, uh, I mean, first of all, you have to understand that this is a Barelvi assertion after a period in Pakistan's history uh, that you're all aware of in which the Diobandis were uh, promoted by the state because of Afghanistan and the, uh, in, in order to sort of fight the, Soviet, uh, the Soviets there. Uh, but I do think that the, 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 the mobilization of Barelvi's diaspora uh, started much earlier. And what we've been witnessing, certainly since Qadri's, um, um, I mean, tragic, I mean, assassination, I mean, horrific assassination of our friend, um, uh, no. Salman Tasir uh, has been a concerted Barelvi assertion. Mm. Um, and, and, and what happened in the 2018 elections was electoral. 
uh, we know that the Barelvis, or rather mainstream religion, religious orthodoxies, uh, uh, really sort of, they go for mainstream parties. So for the first time, a split was created, uh, where the TLP uh, was the spoiler, as it were, uh, in Punjab for the P PMLN, uh, making it possible for the PTI to win. So it's a simple, clear-cut political, political electoral strategy. Mm. You want to call it religious, you can. Uh, but that's your interpretation and not necessarily a correct one or one that cannot be a question. That's, that's, that's definitely very interesting because that's, that's, I think that's the confusion in a lot of people's minds. So what is entirely political is understood as theological or ritual or, or whatever. Okay, um, since you've written so much, I mean, you've written one of the most influential books on Mr. Jinnah, especially Mr. Jinnah's politics and how he understood himself and wanted to be understood. It's interesting that in the 1980s, for example, we saw that General Zia made sure that wherever there was a portrait of Mr. Jinnah in a suit, for example, that portrait was replaced with Mr. Jinnah in a Sherwani. Then we saw that in the last decade, the state, I would say, made a conscious effort to get rid of that Sharwani, even, even when uh, Imran Khan made his first prime ministerial speech. We saw behind him Mr. Jinnah looking like Kamal Atatur, <laughs> basically. Uh, so what do you, do you read something into this? You know, obviously I do. I mean, I think but what, what uh, the general and his uh, associates did not know, uh, because they don't read history, is that um, even the Sherwani is, where is the Sherwani coming from? Is it coming from the Mughal uh, costumes? No, it's coming from the British frock coat. So, I mean, you know, so if you're trying to uh, uh, demodernize or de-westernize or even decolonize Jinnah, and that was not the case. It was, he was just being appropriated uh, for the general's uh, Islamization policies. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's why there has been uh, some at attempt to correct yeah. that. So no matter what you do in the name of Islam and say that it is decolonization, basically you are ending up doing exactly what colonization was trying to do, just to politicize or politicize the identity of that Well, religion. I think that's the best comment here because what is colonization? I mean, you know, especially when we have perpetuated the post-colonial, I and mean, the post-colonial state perpetuates many of the idioms and structures of the colonial state. It's been convenient, and I think one of my most amusing uh, exchanges always with bureaucrats with whom I talk frequently, because they invite me for some odd reason, um, is when I say that, you know, we need a decolonization of the mind, and they say, no, 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 decolonization occurred ages ago. Hmm. <laughs> exactly because they've imbibed those lessons so well from the colonial masters yeah. that they don't realize that they are nothing but uh, the perpetuators of that colonial mm -hmm. attitude. What do you Towards think? their own people. Look at your police, look at your bureaucracy, True. the distrust of, of the common man. You know, the colonial state uh, uh, treated everybody uh, with suspicion. Mm -hmm. And we are a post-colonial state, a national state, and we still treat our people with suspicion. So I think that is where I think Pakistan's decolonization has to go, but the bureaucracy doesn't even get the point. Hmm. So I mean, I don't know what to say. No, I agree, I totally agree. Uh, one last question, and then we'll open up the forum for um, anyone who's interested in asking questions with Ms. Aisha. Aisha, lastly, and, and any historian would say this, that what is occurring today has its roots, and if you want to really understand what's happening today, you cannot understand it until unless you know history. Like, for example, you said the generals and the bureaucrats, they do not know their history. That's why they keep making the same mistakes over and over again, and they keep misreading the current situation. How do you see what's happening in Pakistan at this point in time as a historian? And not not as a, as, a, as, a, as a voter or as, as a... We've seen it before. Uh, it may just be a little bit more... Um, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's more sort of... Conf confusing, more complex, but it's not something that we haven't witnessed, and it's a product of our structural malaise, uh, the, the civil military uh, inequities, uh, the, 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 the problems with the, the, the political system itself, uh, the political parties, uh, uh, which are you know, not necessarily grounded in ideological, um, uh, in, in, any, in any ideology as such, but are, are really, you know, the parties are made by the electables, right? 
so the parties decide who the electables are, uh, uh, and then they are selected. Uh, so I, I do think that Pakistan has to mature, uh, but for that, I think the people of Pakistan have to also mature uh, a little bit and, and, and be less uh, accepting of this constant narrative of running down all politicians regardless. Uh, I do think there are politicians uh, that need to be uh, criticized. Uh, I think that they're also bureaucrats and also military officials. All of us need to be criticized. Not uh, one, we, We're not special and immune. There's nobody has immunity. But I think that we have settled because of a state uh, narrative uh, to focus on the politicians. We are a country 75 years after independence, still not decided whether we are better off as a democracy or as an authoritarian military state. I think that what, what amazes me, especially with the youth, um, uh, is that there are many young people who think that authoritarianism is probably the better thing for Pakistan. Do you think Indians have, or let's say the Indian politicians who have emerged, who have been emerging, and they were always there, just, just beneath the surface. I'm talking about Hindu nationalists. They have realized that it's, no, it's not such a good, big deal or not such a great thing for India to retain the kind of democracy they had or the kind of secularism they had. Why are they so radically and so suddenly changing into what Pakistan became after 1971, I would say? Well, I think there's a big difference still, even though India is uh, moving towards authoritarianism, and I might, might remind you that I also wrote a book called Democracy and Authoritarianism yeah. in South Asia, uh, in which I argued that India is a formal democracy, uh, but uh, it has a, a, a covert authoritarianism embedded in its state apparatus. So India has had a history where you've had an elected government at, in New Delhi, but you've had regions, especially the Northeast, Kashmir, Punjab, uh, which have been, uh, uh, been, there's been an overt authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. So because of India's size, uh, covert, uh, sorry, overt authoritarianism has coexisted with a formally democratic system. Uh, but what's happening now is that it's becoming more difficult with the end of Congress hegemony, mm -hmm. um, uh, certainly by 1967, uh, and I think people t generally say 1989, I tend to see it even earlier. Uh, the result is that nobody can really put forward an all India platform. So in a sense, even the BJP and the Congress are regional parties hmm. claiming all India status. Sure. That is the reason for turns, and, and authoritarianism in my view is a product um, when the, the weaker the state is, the more it relies on authoritarianism. But the stronger the state is, the more democratic it is likely to be. And I think India is finding it more difficult under the BJP, because the BJP knows that it has dominance without hegemony. True. And it wants a Hindu Rashtra. Yeah. And the only way to bring about a Hindu Rashtra is to move in a more authoritarian direction and to, to use the concept of the state of exception, i.e. the sovereign can decide the state of exception. Even the hijab can be a state Mm. right, that the state can decide the exception. Yeah, because the Indians are now, as far as job is concerned, they're pretending that they are like France, even though... But, I mean, but, but, but I think that one of the points that Talal Asad made uh, in one of his very uh, insightful comments on uh, France is that, you know, we assume that France trying to enforce a ban on uh, the hijab uh, in, uh, in, 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 in France is somehow slipping on the liberal ladder. Uh, but he argued very well that it was not that. It was the Carl Schmittian idea of the state of exception, i.e. that the state has a right to do anything it wants. Hmm. And this, I think, is very dangerous and wrong because idea of sovereignty is nothing without the people. And so popular sovereignty and state sovereignty are in a dialectical relationship. So I, I disagree, and I do think that since 9-11, there has been a sudden burst of interest in Schmittian ideas. Agamben has come forward with his theories and mm. made it worse. I disagree with him. Uh, and I do think that it is popular sovereignty that has to be focused upon. Okay, so that there's this tension which is That's going right. on, and there's the conflict going on within uh, the secular paradigm as well. Now we will start taking questions from the audience, uh, if I can see them. Uh, 
Yes. My name is Nawaz. Um, considering India's stable democracy and Pakistani non-political forces continuous interference into politics, don't you think it would have been much better if the British had left subcontinent undivided and united India intact, please? <laughs> uh, counterfactual history is not my forte, uh, but I will try and answer your question. Um, I, I do think, I, I do think, I do think that if you see the Indian problem before, just as prior to the British departure as a federal problem and not a religious one, uh, then the British needed to, and they did their best uh, with the cabinet mission plan uh, to arrive at a federal arrangement. And I don't think many of you are aware, but the cabinet mission plan was put together precisely to appease Mr. Jinnah. And one of the people uh, whose name pro probably won't be liked very much, but who uh, was the brainchild of that plan was Chaudhry Zafrullah. Uh, so I do want to say that an attempt was made by the British, but the Congress and the Muslim League could not agree. And I think the Congress preferred to split rather than share power. Uh, so it wasn't really the British at the, at the end, it was the Congress's decision. Uh, and that's why I said that Pakistan was not expected to survive for more than six months. Uh, that was the view at that time, and the general feeling was uh, that Patel had done a master stroke along with Nehru, uh, and that this country, Muslims, had not only been weakened, but that they'll be further weakened. And if you look at the subcontinent now with Muslims divided into three states, you can see the validity of that. Well, Dr. Aisha Jalal, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Wasik Khan, uh, electrical, telecommunication, computer software engineer. I met you in Canada, Ms. Sagar Gerdes, when you talked about the struggle of Pakistan. I oh, hope you, you remember. I struggle. The struggle of Pakistan. Oh, yes, of course, I see. So, so when your thesis uh, of PhD, Jinnah, Muslim League, and Demand for Pakistan. So, Jinnah was a very modern and liberal leader. So, the state of our country is such that religious fundamentalism is dominating. So, what, so society is very, very much polarized. What do you think? What is the, uh, what is the outcome uh, in future of Pakistan? Well, I, 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 I mean, I concluded my book, uh, uh, The Struggle for Pakistan, uh, which I thought would be the last book I would write specifically on Pakistan, uh, with the view that uh, the future of Jinnah's Pakistan uh, still lies with the people of Pakistan uh, and what they choose to do. Uh, if they want to turn this into a religious theocracy, uh, well, yes, uh, you, you can. Uh, but if you feel that a religious theocracy would not be appropriate, then I think the citizenry has to decide. You still have a chance. Uh, but b because of a variety of reasons, our own inadequacies, our own handicaps, uh, material and otherwise, we have been much more uh, susceptible to global trends. Uh, and I think that if you try to understand in the global context Pakistan's turn towards religion, just to remind you that in the 70s uh, there was talk of left-wing uh, socialism in this country, albeit within the Islamic context, but with the quadrupling of oil prices following the Israeli, Arab-Israeli war, there was a resurgence of Islam led by the Saudis, uh, which brought a lot of money, uh, and Pakistan was just recovering uh, from the loss of East Pakistan, um, and then the, 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 the struggle to create the bomb. Uh, so I, I do think that those have all played a role. I attribute Pakistan's turn uh, to words what you're referring, uh, towards a more uh, you know, rebarbative religiosity uh, as a global trend. Uh, and I do think that this global trend um, has had an impact. And as a historian, I can only say that I think it will change. It will come under challenges in the future to lead to other results. So, but again, it's up to the people of Pakistan what they want to do. I mean, you have the right to vote, you have a, you have a voice. Uh, so I think that uh, rather than just assuming that things are done to Pakistanis, Pakistanis have to take uh, the, the mantle and, and, and actually sort of try and decide their own fate.
Yes, go Hello. ahead. Hello, yes. Uh, my name is Adil. Uh, Professor Aisha's, uh, like I'm quite, quite well aware of your argument about, you know, the partition and seeing uh, religion as, as more of a mobilizational category, not, you know, something which could overwhelmingly change the course of uh, South Asia. But I mean, like, can we really keep these two things antithetical? I mean, like, seeing religion as a purely mobilizational category and and the chasm between the modernist and the traditionalist, uh, wouldn't you think that th the gap was uh, inevitably going to be favoring the traditional elite, uh, traditional elite in the post-partition Pakistan, and, and, and subsequently what became of South Asia in general? I mean, like, religion continued to be uh, an important constitutional category in Pakistan, and what we are seeing in India now is basically a kind of a late, you know, uh, response to what happened during partition. Thank you. Well, yes, I mean, I, I, I think religion is utilized or has been utilized in a certain way here. Uh, but, you know, uh, my next book, uh, which is on Roshan Khayali, uh, will tell you that there is a lot in Islam uh, which is very progressive, potentially. So why do you have to look at the more conservative, more sort of restrictive, exclusive, exclusionary attitudes? So I think Islam needs to be understood. Uh, the problem is that you have instrumentalized Islam to such an extent uh, that you haven't really bothered to understand its history and its content. There's a lot of Islamic philosophy uh, which points to a much more expansive vision than the one you have been given. So when you talk of traditional elite, if you really study these traditional elites, you'll find that their deeper thought on is, is actually quite expansive and open-minded. You know, we are, we are finding that in many levels, Sharia is actually more progressive uh, in certain matters than uh, Anglo-Saxon law, which was imposed here under the British. So I do think that you need to understand your own religion better. Of course, religion will play a part, but what kind of religion will play a part is, I think, very important. I, what I was referring to in, in response to an earlier question is that in the aftermath of uh, uh, the, the quadrupling of oil prices following the Arab-Israeli war, a particular variant which had more of a Saudi uh, impact uh, tended to uh, g gain ascendance. Uh, but as we see, uh, even though uh, we, we look upon it with some skepticism, what's happening in Saudi Arabia, you can't rule out that things may be changing. Aisha, uh, you just uh, mentioned that your next book is going to be about Roshan Khayali. It's called Enlightened Islam. Yes. For that, did you go back to the 19th century where this sort of an idea did yes, come up? Yes, it's primarily based on the late 19th, early 20th century. And uh, do you see... And all the way to... I mean, I'll, I'll say things about the present, but it's not a chronological history. Yeah. It's a thematic history. Yeah. But uh, that played... Let, let's take Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan, for example, and his role and his narrative about Muslim modernism and Roshan Khayali and how Islam is inherently progressive, inherently democratic, and how Islam actually uh, informed the enlightenment which actually happened in Europe and died in, uh, in, in, in the Muslim world due to various reasons. Um, and that evolved into the Aligarh movement, which then informed the All India Muslim League. So basically, what is the purpose of your book? You, do you want that sort of an idea or thought to return in an updated manner and be taken up by political forces? No, I mean, I think, I think the problem that I'm addressing is not Pakistan-specific. Uh, the, the point is that it has become commonplace to regard Islam or equate it with uh, really uh, obscurantist, uh, uh, anachronistic ideas. Uh, it's really based, it's, it's a, that's, that's itself is a political construct. I mean, it's a deliberate attempt to, uh, which, is, which has been happening ever since colonial days. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm trying to sort of show that there are, there are different interpretations of Islam. Uh, and I think that's all I would say, uh, that, that you have to be skeptical about the kinds of interpretations you're presented, because there are multiple interpretations of Islam, and I recommend, uh, for starters, Shahab's, Shahab Ahmed's very good book, Understanding, or What is Islam? Uh, because you, you, know, you, you recognize that Islam is an interpretive community, uh, and people make of Islam what they wish. Yeah. And the public face of Islam has been a product of mobilizational techniques. 
which you may or may not agree with. And if you don't agree with it, then you make yourself make that, that, that known. Uh, but I do think that the easy slippage between uh, real obscurantism and Islam has been a product of Western dominance and our easy acceptance of Western categories. So I think that you need to wake up. Uh, it requires a lot of work, I must say. I've really been breaking my back on, on reading this material. But there is a lot more variety in Islam and a lot more to be hopeful about. And I say this especially to the youth. Let's have more questions. We have time for two questions. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, My name is Sadia. So I've been listening to this discussion and uh, we've talked about uh, Britishers using uh, religion uh, to create disparity between Hindus and Muslims and post-partition about um, using as a political tool and uh, varieties of uh, religious um, sects uh, uh, currently prevalent in our society and so on and so forth. So my question is, because religion is nothing tangible, is a set of values. Uh, should we really consider it as something purely personal? And second question is, uh, do you think, uh, keeping in mind the current situation in Pakistan, uh, the way forward is to separate religion and state, maybe? Thank you. Uh, too simplistic to separate religion and state. I've always maintained that the great fallacy, again, is uh, the easy acceptance of Western um, constructs as um, universal is a critique of Western universe, the false West universalistic claims of the West. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you get the impression that because the, 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 the West, or rather Europe, did it differently uh, than us, we must somehow follow them. Uh, but I, I, I think that uh, if you take religion and the state question, uh, in the case of Europe, uh, in the case of the West, it was the separation of church and state. There was no church in Islam or in Hinduism to separate from. Secularism in South Asia means the neutrality of the state in matters to do with religion, that i.e. no single community will be favored. Uh, so I think that neutrality, uh, um, we also know, has become difficult uh, because the state is constantly being called upon to intervene, and sometimes it intervenes on its own volition. Uh, which means that the state can't really be neutral. Uh, but I do think that political mobilization, political uh, activity can restore some balance so that uh, you know, s supporting just one community as opposed to the other is not the case. Because ultimately, what you're witnessing in India is precisely that majoritarianism, uh, that although India claims to be secular, Although India, and that secularism is not church, and I mean, it's not church and state, it's about neutrality. India no longer even bothers about neutrality, nor does Pakistan. I would say that the neutrality of the state, even though it's difficult to actually implement, is what we might wish to aspire for. Uh, because there are certain matters uh, which are very personal uh, in matters to do with religion, which the state has no business really intervening in. Uh, there may be other matters, but these are matters for people to debate. Uh, you know, uh, this is what I feel, uh, th I mean, you know, th 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 that people are not being allowed to debate these thoughts. And there's a view that only the, 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 the clerics or the, uh, those who claim to have uh, ownership of the religious texts are the ones to listen to. I suggest you read your own religion and its history, and you'll see. Uh, that it is actually um, a, a much more expansive, progressive, inclusive religion than the one you've been told it is. I think it's true. Thank you. Uh, there is no church in Islam and there is no church in Hinduism. Right. But do you think that the state became the church in Pakistan from the 1980s? Not just Pakistan. India uh, now. Everywhere. I mean, the, church, the, state, the modern nation state is the problem. Uh, that it has, you know, it, it was created, uh, the idea is, it says that the modern nation state extends equal rights of citizenship to all, but the modern nation state, as Talal Asad has again shown brilliantly in his uh, formations of the secular, uh, uh, the, the state has started intervening in matters to do with religion as well. Uh, so that has been the primary problem. Uh, uh, more than anything else, and it's not Pakistan specific, is all I can assure you of. 
But the only way to correct that is to change yourself, to learn more, so that you can actually have an informed debate on matters to do with religion, which you leave to others who present you with increasingly improbable conceptions of religion, which you then either accept or get afraid of. I mean, I have found Islam and my understandings of different, and of course there are different interpretations of it, but if Islam is indeed an interpretive community, what role are you playing in that interpretive community? Let's have some more questions. So I think kind of overlapping with several of the other questions that were asked, considering Pakistan is going in a direction of accommodating extremist religious factions, seeing certain parties gain leverage, increasing amounts of leverage over the government, two main questions, what road do you see Pakistan going down? Integrating religion even deeper into our state, or do you think it's possible to make a reasonable separation? And a slight sub-question, do you think that we're going down a similar path as Afghanistan? Uh, I think what I was suggesting is that religion itself is a contested category. What interpretations are you giving to religion? Uh, what, 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 what are you actually saying? I mean, there are many different interpretations. Even legally, you'll see that there are many different schools of legal thought with different interpretations. Uh, so I think that the it, it all depends on the particular take of religion uh, that's given. I'm not suggesting that religion is going to disappear, but I do think that there are certain interpretations of religion and certain limits uh, to which the state should not go to. Um, as for Pakistan moving to Afghanistan, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I think that they're very different historic, uh, uh, they're very different histories, very different state structures, um, uh, and I don't anticipate that happening anytime soon. So can I just ask one small question? Yeah, go please, please uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, as a student in Pakistan, I worry for every student who has to study Pak studies because of its altered and filtered content. So as this country progresses, <laughs> Do you think it's at all possible for this syllabus to be revised because of SNC, the single national curriculum, coming into being? And how do you think today's current events will be altered 50 years later? Uh, that's a very good question. Of course, uh, uh, it, it can be altered. Um, uh, the, the, I mean, I, I always say that you obviously have to read your textbooks. Uh, uh, you don't have to believe in them. Uh, you, can, you can read other, uh, uh, other stuff. Uh, you know, I went and gave a talk at the University of Gujarat some years ago, and I spoke on the sole spokesman, Jinnah's demand for Pakistan. And after I finished, uh, uh, one very worried professor said that, you know, this is all very well, but they're going to give their exams, and what should they write now? <laughs> And I said, well, you know, you've just heard me, and maybe that sorted out the confusions in your mind, but write what's in, in for the exam, write what's in the, in the books, <laughs> so that you pass your exams. <laughs> but I think what I'm trying to suggest is that you should make a distinction between the textbooks and your own education. The trouble is that education in Pakistan has become nothing but passing exams. You know, there was a conception, I mean, he mentioned Sir Sayyid, Sayyid Ahmad Khan, uh, I mean, tarbiyat character building, read more, there's much bigger. I mean, don't believe everything. Education is not about, I mean, for me, education is not uh, to be told what to think, but how to think. So I would say, take the textbooks until they can be changed, and I hope they can be. Uh, but that also depends, that's also in your hands, in the hands of the people of this country. I think, Aisha, one problem which you mentioned, what happens is anyone who wants to interpret uh, their faith, they can't help but do it politically. Yeah? I mean, why? Why? I mean, it depends. I mean, why politically? I mean, you could, you, it's political if you're in the political field, but I think religion is a personal matter. It's your own relationship with the Creator. But th that, that is the issue which a lot of Pakistanis have, and of course a lot of Muslims have started having, especially after no, no. the... You see, they're both things. There is your relationship with the Creator, but when you take collective action uh, and are using religion, you may not agree with those who... You, and so you try to convince them. True. 
So you, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, I, I feel that there is too easy an acceptance of those publicists and propagandists and their view of religion. I would, I, I suggest that you need to be more skeptical because I assure you that Islam is much more expansive and, 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 and varied than what you are being presented with. I mean, you just only have to just go back to the 19th century and see what the, the great thinkers of this part of the world were writing to know that what has happened to you is just quite new and likely to change in the future as well. Uh, Aisha, we all see the increasing role of military in Pakistani politics. Do you see any chance of separating the two? And what methodology could the politician or the military think about it? It's not going to change anytime soon, uh, but you have to go through processes and <laughs> some teething problems. Phone already, uh, uh, So I, I, I do think that... <laughs> So, so I, that's all I can say. I mean, it's not going to change anytime soon. One more question. Hello. Just the, yeah. Um, uh, my name is Gulze, and I'm a. Mm. <laughs> Hello. Uh, here. Oh, uh, sorry. Sorry. I was uh, going, there was a mic going around there as well. So yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, Ishtiaq Ahmed has a theory about the creation of Pakistan that it was a buffer state to kind of normalize the leftist and communist or Marxist idea that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru has an inclination about. And I feel like that is very much of a conspiracy theory or, a, you know, a very non-factual theory. So what is your idea about that? Does that uh, feel like a logical progression of how, why Pakistan was created by British or you know, I don't agree with that at all. Uh, uh, Mr. Ishtiaq Ahmed is a political scientist uh, and talks to bureaucrats in Pakistan too much who have their own idea about what Pakistan, why Pakistan was created. Thank you for saying uh, that. That's not history. That's political science. Thank you for saying that. Any more questions? Yeah, up. Yeah, now on the left. Hello. Last question. Okay. So, uh, during the discussion, you mentioned that you were disappointed with the way uh, students are tilting towards an authoritarian form of uh, considering the state and not the democratic values. Uh, we do consider that as disappointment as students as well. But what is being taught to us is, since you are an academic and a historian, what is being taught to us since the very beginning is again, is in the control of the state. What is being propagated are pro textbooks uh, and building on her questions, uh, we do have uh, students who are challenging this in the name of like, we are organizing student solidarity marches, uh, not to uh, challenge and questions the authoritarian form of government, but also the institution in terms of like education institution as well, there are authoritarian policies in terms of dealing with the students' problems. So how far do you think that what is the way ahead for the students in terms of which way? Because we see that uh, there is a jamiyat e talba Pakistan or the state. We, they are turning to violence in terms of like enforcing a certain ideology, while on the, on the other hand, students are facing this uh, general problem. And students coming from periphery are challenging these things. And students from the mainstream, I'm not saying they are not doing it, but uh, I have seen very less number of students uh, who are part of the mainstream and they're not like raising questions in terms of the existing order. So what, wh what is the way ahead for students? First thing, I would urge students to avoid violence at all costs. Uh, you must mobilize, you must uh, come together and, and voice your criticisms of what is being taught to you both in classrooms. I did that all my life. Uh, so I mean, you continue doing that. But I think the only thing I can say to you is that I'm sitting in the United States at the moment where there is a sea change taking place in how um, history is taught or how anything is taught. Uh, for instance, um, you know, uh, Columbus Day no longer exists. It's Indigenous Peoples Day. So the students across the United States have, have mobilized uh, and have changed. And so now their new kind, uh, I mean, race, 
uh, diaspora and colonialism departments are coming up. The whole white privilege is being questioned. So things can change, but they take time. So you must not lose uh, uh, faith. My only advice to the youth is not to believe everything in your textbooks, uh, but to read more. We don't read enough. You don't read enough, and I must urge you to do that. Thank you, Aisha. That's, unfortunately, that's the only time we have. And by reading, uh, it means reading books and articles, and not only tweets. Not just uh, social media. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aisha, and thank you for everybody.